Good day, grade 11s. Welcome to this next lesson in mathematics. Um, I don't know if you recall, but in our last lesson, which was on Thursday, we were looking, no, it was on Wednesday, we were looking at functions. And we were looking at exam questions and we got as far as doing this determine the range of f in this question over here. And what we are going to do is we're going to just um, carry on with this question and then we're going to move on to trigonometry. I like to finish questions. So I know it's quite a long time ago to go through this, but I want to go through this with you. So just to remind you, we had a graph of f of x equals x squared plus bx plus c, which was the parabola. We had to work out what c was, but we knew that the axis symmetry was 1, x equals 1, so we could find the coordinates of, sorry, c, 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 b, c, c, we could find the coordinates um, of C from the fact that we had the axis of symmetry was 1, so this would be 2 away and 2 away, and then we could use it, and we found the equation of um, F in the form of Y is equal to 1X squared plus BX plus C, where A was 1, and then we got this here. That was the formula for the equation for F. And we've done the range of f, which is that y is going to be greater than or equal to minus 4 for y is an element of real values. Now we are going to move on to this bit here, which is calculate the equation of g in the form y is equal to mx plus c for which phase of x or da, da 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 da. So this is what we're going to be doing. Okay, so let's move on and let's change color to dark blue. It says, Calculate the equation of G in the form of Y is equal to MX plus C. So we're looking at the straight line graph now. We're looking at this graph. And they want the graph in the form of Y equals MX plus C. Okay, but the cool thing about that is we have two points on this graph already. We've got the B, which is 3, 0. And we've got A, which is 1 minus 4, which means we can easily find the gradient. Okay, we can say M equals y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. So we just need to choose a point to be 1 and 2. And as I keep telling you, it really doesn't matter which order you do this in. So I'm going to call this point 1 and this point 2. So it becomes minus 4 minus 0 over 1 minus 3. And the only thing that's really important is that you always subtract y's from y's and x's from x's, and you do it in the same order. So if I'm going minus five, 4 minus 0, I can't go and then go 3 minus 1. It has to be. So it's going to be minus 4 minus 0 is minus 4 over 1 minus 3 is minus 2, which is just 2, which is great because we want a positive gradient because it's going up to the right. So now we know it's y is equal to 2x plus c, and now we can substitute either of these points in to get the y capped with a value of c. I'm going to substitute 3, 0 in because it's easier when you've got a 0 somewhere. So 0 equals 2 times by 3 plus c. So c is obviously equal to minus 6. How did I get that? Well, 2 times 3 is 6, and I take it to the other side. So therefore, my equation is y is equal to 2x minus 3, okay, and minus 6, oh, sorry, minus 6, minus 6, minus 6. Okay, now it says, for which values of x will f of x be greater than or equal to 0? Okay, so we're looking at f of x, so we're looking at the parabola, okay, and they want to know for which values will f of x be greater than or equal to zero? So what are they really asking? They're asking when will the y values of the parabola be greater than or equal to zero? So it's wherever it's above the y-axis, do you agree? So it's going to be, yeah, and then it's going to be up there, okay? So it'll be for x is greater than or equal to 3, and we must say equal to because it's equal to over there, or x has to be smaller than or equal to minus 1. Smaller than or equal to, it's going to be this side of minus 1. Okay, next they ask us, when is f of x? Let's write it over here. I think we're running out of space up there. And let's do black. They want to know when is f of x divided by g of x 
greater than zero. Okay, so what are they saying? They're saying the y value of the parabola divided by the y value of the straight line has got to be greater than zero, which means they're looking for when f of x is positive divided by positive or negative divided by negative. Okay, so they want both the parabola and the straight line to be on the same side of the x-axis. Okay, do you understand that? So let's have a look, okay? And I'm gonna go with, oh, I'm running out of colors, light blue. Do you agree over here, the parabola is positive, but the straight line is negative? Yeah, the parabola is negative and the straight line is negative all the way through to yeah, and then the cool thing happens. Yeah, the parabola is positive and the straight line is positive. So do you agree it works from here onwards, but not this number? Because they want it to be greater than zero. So I would say that it'd be from X, oh, you can't see that blue on that thing, like a black. For X is greater than minus one, x does not equal 3 and obviously x is an element of real values so x must be greater than minus 1 so it's above minus 1 but x does not equal 3 and then x is an element of real values another way that you could have written this is you could have said that x is smaller than 3 and greater than minus 1 or x is bigger than 3 in other words it's valid from here three year to year, and then from three onwards, but not actual three. Why not actually three? Because it equals zero at three, and zero divided by zero is nothing, so can't happen. Okay, so that's that one. Now we're looking at x multiplied by f of x. X multiplied, okay, so I'm running out of space, so I'm just gonna erase some of the stuff. I can't unfortunately erase all the ink because I need some of the stuff, I think, yeah. Okay, so what are they asking? They're asking when is x multiplied by f of x, x multiplied by f of x greater than zero. In other words, they want the x value and the y value of f of x must be positive. It must either be positive multiplied by positive or it must be minus times by minus. Okay, so do you agree from here onwards, x is negative, but y is positive? But then, let's get the highlight out. Do you agree from here to here, the y, the y value of the parabola is negative and the x values are negative? All the way along here, the y values are negative, but the x values are positive. But from here onwards, the parabola's y values are positive and the x values are positive. Okay, so therefore, let's see if we can write that out. So let's go pen. We're going to have x must be between 0 and minus 1 or x must be greater than 3. That's it. For x is an element. Oh, we don't even have to write that. We don't have to write that. That's if there's demands and ranges. Okay, right. So do you understand that? Okay, so that's what we're aiming for with this. Okay, just when, whenever they ask if something multiplied by that is greater than zero, then they have to be the same sign. Or if it's smaller than zero, then obviously it has to be opposite signs. Now it says, for which values of P will X squared minus 2X plus P equal P have non-real roots? Okay, so what are they really saying to you? Do you look, if you look at this, okay, this x squared minus 2x equals p, do you agree that I can rewrite that to be x squared minus 2x minus p? Okay, and do you see that that is the same shape as this thing here? It's exactly the same shape. It's got an x squared, it's got a minus 2x, and now this time it's minus p instead of minus three okay and what they're saying is what values if what p value must i substitute in here to make this have non-real roots so do you agree that if i if this is to have non-real roots it cannot cross the x-axis which means i have to move this up 
I have to make it so that it does something like that. It is parallel to it's up, it goes up, it's exactly the same shape, even if my drawing isn't, but it's just been moved up so that it doesn't touch. So what does it have to move up? Do you agree it has to move up a minimum of four? Okay. So what values of P must this be? Okay. Now yeah, it's a tricky bit, okay? If we go plus four, what does that become? It becomes x squared minus two x um, minus four, okay, which is actually going to give you what we have. Well, it's going to give you similar to what we have now. It's going to be move it down. So we actually have to have a negative value. So P has to be, oh, I keep forgetting you can't see this color against blue. P has to be a negative value. And what does it have to be? It has to be all the numbers that are smaller than minus four. In other words, minus four, minus five, minus six. In fact, it can't even be minus four. If it minus four, it just moves it up and touches, and then it has real roots. So P has to be smaller than minus four. And remember when we say smaller than, we mean minus four and a half, minus four and three quarters, minus four and seven eighths, et cetera, et cetera. Or minus five, minus six. Okay, so P has to be smaller than minus four, which will move this up to just above the x-axis and therefore it will have non-real roots. Okay, now, just let's remember that this is y is equal to two x minus six. So I just want to erase over the ink and then write this as y equals two x minus six. Okay, now it says, T is a point, T, there's T, on the x-axis and M is the midpoint, is a point, sorry, is a point on F such that TM is perpendicular to the x-axis. It then says TM intersects G at P. Okay, calculate the maximum length of P. Oh my word, this is such a cool question for the simple reason that even though this is in the graph section, this is in differentiation. And grade 11s, we haven't done differentiation yet, so in calculus, so you don't have to worry about that question, okay? This question we will do when we have taught you differentiation. Okay, moving on to trigonometry. Okay, so we're first going to go through quickly, very briefly, the stuff that you should know from last year. And then what we're going to do is we're going to move on to trig IDs and things like that. Okay, and the 180 plus or minus rule if we have enough time today. Okay, so the first thing you should know is Sokotoa or silly old hens cackle and howl till old age. And I mean, my teacher taught me something else as well, but I can't remember what it was. I think I was the only school in the whole world that used the other one, so don't worry about it. Okay, I don't care what you use as long as you know that what it means is that sine theta is the opposite side over the hypotenuse. Cos theta equals the adjacent side over the hypotenuse. And tan theta equals the opposite over adjacent. Okay, and there's another thing you need to know. Um, I know that some teachers like to teach y over r, x over r, x over y, or whatever. That's cool. I have no problem with that. The problem with it is, or well, what I find with my students, is that if we have three-dimensional or uh, diagrams that look something like this, where there's something like this, and now we need to work out this actual triangle, yeah, it gets very difficult to work out which is the X and which is the Y and which is the R. When I, when I say the triangle, I mean the triangle that's across it, okay? Like if we, this was a corner of a book and then we put a piece of cardboard across it, okay? So things like that get a little bit tricky when you've got tans, opposites, hypotenuses and things like that. So what I tend to do is rather use opposite hypotenuse and adjacent instead of X, Y's and R's. Okay, so... Whichever makes you happy, whichever you prefer is the way to go. So the opposite side, okay, so the opposite side of the right angle, and remember Sokoto only works with 90 degree triangles, okay? It doesn't work with your funny other shaped triangles. It has to have a 90 degree in it. Why? Because the opposite side is the hypotenuse, and you only find hypotenuses 
I don't know, hypotenuses. Many hypotenuse in, in the right angle triangles. The side that's next to the angle, whichever angle we choose, so if we choose this to be theta, then this side is going to be the adjacent side, and the side that's opposite it is going to be the opposite side. So in this case, sine theta would be opposite over hypotenuse, would be A over C. Cos theta would be the B over C. And tan theta is opposite over adjacent, which is A over B. Okay, now reciprocal ratios. In other words, reciprocals mean one over, one over. So we're talking about one over sine theta. So it's the inverse. Okay, think of it as the inverse. So one over sine theta is actually cosecant theta. One over tan theta is actually cot theta. And 1 over cos theta is actually secant theta. Okay, so obviously if sa, hang on, sa, ka, toa, okay, sa, ka, toa, I like to draw it out like that because then it's sine is opposite of our partner, is cos is adjacent, of our partner is tan is opposite of adjacent. And let's say this is theta again. And this sine is opposite of hypotenuse, and cosecant is going to be hypotenuse over opposite. Cos is adjacent over hypotenuse, and secant is going to be hypotenuse over adjacent. And tan is opposite over adjacent, means that cut is going to be adjacent over opposite and that's all the reciprocals are so in other words if we said that this was the hypotenuse this was the adjacent side and this was the opposite side then in this case the cosecant would be the hypotenuse over the opposite so it's going to be c over a tan is going to be adjacent over opposite so that's going to be b over a and secant is hypotenuse over adjacent, so therefore it's going to be C over B. And that's all the reciprocals are. It's just the inversion, invert, yeah, the inverted angles. Okay, so now you've got your special triangles, your 30, 60, and 45 degree triangles. And guys, you really need to learn how to draw these. So let me just go through it quickly with you. Um, basically, the way you get it, the 60-30 triangle is, and I know that some people struggle to work out where the 60, where the 30 is, so I'm going to show you how they get to the 30-60 triangle, and then maybe that'll be easier for you. Okay, so what they did was they took an equilateral triangle. So an equilateral triangle is a line, triangle that's got all three sides are equal, and all three angles are 60 degrees. Okay. And what they did was they split it in half. They dropped down a perpendicular. Right. But dropping down the perpendicular, this is now 90 degrees, okay? We split this angle. So this angle becomes 30 degrees, okay? And then another thing that they did when they were busy designing this triangle is they let all the sides equal two, okay? Because they're equilateral. So that means that this side is still two, in length. This side is half of the original, so this is one. And then if you use Pythagoras, you find that that is root three. And that is how you get your 30, 60, tri 90, tri 30, 60, 90 triangle. Okay, so I know it's drawn slightly differently, yeah, but that is exactly how you do it. So my version looks like this, and it doesn't matter which version you guys learn, as long as you actually know them, and you do need to know them, because they are going to be questions that they're going to ask you to solve without the use of a calculator. Okay, so in that case, if we look at sine of 30 degrees, so if we're looking at 30 degrees as being our theta, then do you agree this is still hypotenuse, this is going to be my opposite side, and this is going to be my adjacent side. And sine is, let's just write, so, ka, toa. Sine is opposite over hypotenuse. So it's one 
over 2. Cos of 30 degrees is going to be adjacent over hypotenuse, so it's going to be root 3 over 2. Tan of 30 degrees is going to be opposite over adjacent, so it's 1 over root 3. Okay? Now, if we look at the 60 degree triangle, in other words, now we're looking at 60 as being the theta, then this side is my opposite side and this side is my adjacent. And that's still the hypotenuse. Then we've got sine 60 degrees is opposite of hypotenuse. So it's root three over two. Cos of 60 degrees is adjacent of hypotenuse, which is one over two. And tan of 60 degrees is opposite over adjacent, which is just root 3. Okay, right, now let's look at the right angle triangle. The right angle triangle is just as easy. We just take two sides that are equal in length, put, make them be perpendicular to each other. If these two sides are equal in length and we designate them 1, 1, then these two triangles have to be equal because they're base angles of our Sussex triangle. And they're 45 degrees and this is root 2. Then again, if we're looking at Sakatoa, again, it doesn't make a difference which one we use a theta, right? Because they're both 45 degrees. So let's choose the bottom one, okay? So I can say, okay, fine. Sine of 45 degrees is equal to opposite, because if I'm choosing this side, then do you read this is the opposite? This is the adjacent, and this is the hypotenuse, right? Sine is opposite of hypotenuse, so it's 1 over root 2. Cos of 45 degrees is adjacent of our hypotenuse, so it's 1 over root 2. And amazingly, tan of 45 degrees is just 1. Okay, so you need to know these. You need to learn them. You need to know them off by heart, okay? Why? Because we are going to need them. Okay, now before we carry on using, remember we're just revising everything you should know from last year. So, Another thing that we're going to look at is the cast diagram. Um, some of you may notice all stations to Cape Town or whatever. I know that there are some uh, risque versions going around. I don't care how you remember it, as long as you remember that it's all stations to Cape Town or the cast diagram. And what it's saying is, if you recall, that all of the trigonometric functions are positive. In other words, your sine is positive here, your cos is positive here, and your tan is positive here. Yeah, only sine is positive. Only sine is positive. Yeah, only tan is positive. And yeah, only cos is positive. And it's in the curriculum to teach you this, specifically in grade 10, so I'm not going to go through it with you. Go look at your textbooks if you can't remember it, but this year, all you have to do is use the knowledge. They're not asking you to ever prove it that, um, that sine um, of theta is positive in the second quadrant. You're only going to have to use that knowledge to solve problems. So let's talk about the quotient identity. The quotient identity is one of the only quotient, only rules that you have to learn. I mean, well, the proofs that you have to do for trig, okay? Um, so what we're saying is that tan theta equals sine theta over cos theta. Okay, so what we do is we choose an angle in the first quadrant, okay? And we drop down a perpendicular. So do you agree that this would be x long, this would be y long, and this would be r long? Okay, so we're going to take the right hand side. Now remember when you're proving something, you cannot assume that they're equal and then go about things. You either have to look at the left hand side or the right hand side. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the right hand side and we're going to go Sakatoa. Okay, so the right hand side is sine theta divided by cos theta. That's really what they're saying, sine theta over cos theta. So sine theta is opposite over hypotenuse because there's theta, so it's opposite over hypotenuse is y over r divided by cos theta. Now cos theta is x adjacent over hypotenuse, so it's x over r, okay? Therefore, 
do you agree that when we divide by a fraction, what do we do? We tip and times. So we go y. Oh, sorry, it really irritates me when this pen does this. Uh, we go y over r times by r over x, which then cancels, which is then the y over the x. But do you agree that y is the opposite side and x is the adjacent side? So what do we have? That is equal to the same as tan theta, which is therefore means that we've proven it. We don't put error equals, but error proven. Okay, sorry, we can say equals the left hand side and then you can write proven. Okay, so that there is called the quotient identity. And guys, you have to know how to prove it. It's not very difficult, it's actually quite easy. But you have to remember to do the drawing, excuse me, and you have to remember how to do this. Okay, now we're going to talk about trig IDs. So what we're going to do is we're going to simplify using our knowledge of our cast diagram, okay, um, all stations to Cape Town, and whatever else we might know. Okay, so some of the other trick ideas we know. So one of the other trick ideas we know, you should know, is that sine squared theta plus cos squared theta is equal to one. That's one of our trick identities, right? That you should know from last year. We should know from last year. Sine squared theta plus cos squared theta equals one. Okay, so do you agree that means that cos squared theta could equal 1 minus sine squared theta and sine squared theta is equal to 1 minus cos squared theta. Okay, so that means we can take this 1 minus sine squared theta and we could replace it with cos squared theta. So this becomes 1 over cos squared theta multiplied by cos squared theta cancel cancel equals 1. Okay, so that was a very easy trig identity. Let's see if we've got something else. Okay, so yeah, we've got sine B, cos B, and tan B. So I'm going to think about the fact that sine theta over cos theta is tan theta. That we know. Okay, sine theta over cos theta equals tan theta. And let's see if I can rearrange this tan B and cos B to try and make something nice happen. Okay, so this is 1 over sine B minus, now let me divide these. Okay, this becomes cos B divided by tan B, but tan B is sine theta over Oh, sorry, some B, 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 sine B over cos B, okay? But what do you do when you've got a fraction and you're dividing? You tip and times. So this becomes 1 over sine B minus, remember this is cos B over 1 times by tipping and timesing cos b over sine b. Okay, so what does this become? It becomes 1 minus sine b minus cos squared b over sine b. Right, so do you agree they have the same denominator? So I can write them all over the same thing. I'm going 1 minus cos squared b over sine b. Okay, so now I'm thinking, well, the ones in causes and the other ones in sines, again, what do I know? What, what trick ID do I know from grade 10 that will help me? And I know the fact that sine squared theta plus cos squared theta equals 1. Therefore, cos squared theta is equal to 1 minus sine squared theta and sine squared theta is equal to 1 minus cos squared theta. So do you agree I can replace this 1 minus cos squared b, b with sine squared b? I can just go equals sine squared b over sine b. But that means that we've got sine squared b over sine b. This cancels with that and you're left with sine b. Ta-da! 
Okay, that wasn't so bad here. Guys, I just want to again suggest to you that if you're struggling with this, that you watch a recording of the video. And the best way to do it is, like I said, is that if you've struggled with this um, or you're really not sure how to do it, then watch me do it, okay? Then watch the video again and then just pause at, for example, this point. And then try the question by yourself. And then obviously you can watch it afterwards and see if you got it right. Okay, so this looks very similar again. We've got a tan squared alpha uh, multiplied by a cos squared alpha plus sine squared alpha over tan squared alpha. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do is change all the tans to sines over cos's. Okay, and see if it makes anything happen. So this becomes sine squared alpha over cos squared alpha multiplied by cos squared alpha plus bracket sine squared alpha divided by sine squared alpha over cos squared alpha. Okay, so they cancel. Yay! So we're left with sine squared alpha plus, now remember that when we divide, what do we do? We tip in times. So it becomes sine squared alpha times by cos squared alpha over sine squared alpha. These cancel, yay! So you're left with sine squared alpha plus one times cos squared alpha is just cos squared alpha. And what does that become? It becomes one. Okay, not too bad, hey? Right, and we'll talk about the restrictions in a minute. The restrictions are the fact that we are dividing by things here. Okay, so this is a bit different. Before we had to simplify, now we have to prove. We have to prove that the left-hand side equals the right-hand side. Now, there are lots of ways that we can go about doing this. One of the ways that we can do it is, you can start, in other words, you can start with either the left-hand side or the right-hand side, or if you get stuck, you can do both, okay, to get them to equal something that's similar. Okay, so let us look at the left-hand side, the left-hand side. The left-hand side is one minus sine alpha over cos alpha, okay. Now, do you agree that I could get, we know, sorry, let me just show you what I'm talking about, what I'm thinking. I'm thinking that sine squared alpha plus cos squared alpha is equal to one, okay? And then I'm thinking that cos squared alpha is equal to one minus sine squared alpha. And then I'm thinking if I multiply this by its it's um, some difference of two squares, the other half of it, I will end up with this, and then I, which means that it equals this, which would cancel with that. So that's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking along those lines. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply the top by one plus sine alpha. But what I do to the top, I have to do to the bottom. So this becomes one plus sine alpha, okay? Now, do you agree when I multiply those out, that becomes 1 minus sine squared alpha multiplied by cos alpha bracket 1 plus sine alpha. Now, 1 minus sine squared alpha is equal to cos squared alpha. So, therefore, that becomes cos squared alpha, okay? Multiplied by, divided by cos alpha 1 plus sine alpha. That cancels with that, so it equals cos alpha over 1 plus sine alpha, which equals the right-hand side. Yay! Now we're almost finished. We just have to say when this doesn't work. And when does this not work? This cannot work when the denominator equals 0. If the denominator is equal 0, then it means that we're dividing by 0, which is undefined. So what we now need to say is, okay, this won't work when cos of alpha equals 0 or 1 plus sine alpha equals 0. So now we need to show, work those out, okay? We actually need to work out for which values of alpha this won't work. So let me just rewrite this. It's going to be for cos alpha equals 0 or for 1 plus sine alpha equals 0. 
So, all we need to do now is the second function of cos, second function cos of zero. So we're going to go shift, and we're going to go shift cos of zero, close bracket equals, it's 90 degrees. So alpha it cannot equal, if alpha equals 90 degrees, or plus K360, in other words, 360 degrees of it, okay, or if sine alpha is equal to minus one, so let's go look what that is. So it's gonna be shift sine of negative one, close bracket equals negative 90 degrees. So an alpha equals negative 90 degrees plus K360. So those are the restrictions, okay? Alpha cannot equal 90 degrees, cannot equal 90 degrees plus K360 of them. In other words, every 360 revolutions. Or alpha cannot equal minus 90 degrees plus K360 degrees, okay? In other words, we're covering every revolution. So it cannot equal 90 degrees, okay? Or every revolution thereafter. And similarly, alpha cannot equal minus 90 degrees or every revolution after. That's when this is not valid. Okay, so your restrictions are, these are the restrictions. The restrictions are when these things here equal naught, when the denominators equal naught. Okay, so we're going to look at this one again. I don't know how far we're going to get. Um, we might have to leave the restrictions till the next lesson, but let's go through it. Okay, again, it's a proof. So we either have to choose the left-hand side and prove that the left-hand side equals the right-hand side, or we can choose the right-hand side and try and get it to equal the left-hand side. But if we look at this right-hand side, do you see it just says cos A? I mean, there's not much we can do with it. <laughs> so therefore, we have to work with the left-hand side. Okay, so left-hand side is 1 over cos A minus cos A times by tan squared A over 1. So do you agree, before we can do anything, we need this to be over one whole fraction. So we're going to use the common denominator of cos A. So cos A divided into cos A is 1, 1 times 1 is 1 minus 1 goes into cos A, cos A times, so we're going to multiply the cos A with the numerator, so it becomes cos squared A tan squared A, okay, because cos A times the cos A is cos squared A. So now, this is starting to get somewhere, except that do you agree tan squared A can be written as what? This becomes 1 minus cos squared A sine squared A over cos squared A, all over cos A. So do you agree this cancels with that? Yay! So that becomes 1 minus sine squared A, all over cos A, okay? But 1 minus sine squared A equals cos squared A. Why? Because sine squared theta plus cos squared theta equals 1 is one of the identities we already know. So that equals cos squared A over cos A, which equals cos A, because that cancels with that. Yay! Okay, so the only time that you have to worry about a restriction here is when cos A equals 0. Cos A cannot equal 0. And as we know from before, cos of theta, alpha here was 0, then alpha was 90 degrees, Therefore, A cannot equal 90 degrees or any of its 360 degree revolutions. There you go. Right, grade 11, that's it for today. Please, please come back on Wednesday and we'll continue going through trig and trig IDs and then move you on to 180 plus or minus rule, 360 plus reduction formula in other words, and then we'll be looking at examples of that. Have a great day.